today I'm really excited about this particular interview because this is a, a really good friend of mine who I've known now for, uh, I was thinking about it today, Alan, we've actually known each other for um, 22 years now. Uh, wow, has it been that long? It's, it's been that long. Yeah, yeah. Alan was one of the very first people that I met when I first came to Nashville. And uh, Alan has has mixed uh, six number ones. He's had many more uh, top tens. He's worked with artists including Aretha Franklin, Michael McDonald, many others, which I'm sure we're going to talk about today. And uh, what I think is particularly interesting about Alan's story and his career path comes down to the concept of what's called a, a red and blue ocean. And if you've never heard of this before, basically what a red ocean is, a red ocean has a lot of sharks in the water, right? So, so when you come into that into that ocean or into that little part of the water, you can you can <laughs> you can get eaten by the big sharks, and that's really what happens when you're in a high highly competitive market, right? So, like say you're like into the pop market or you want to work in the pop market. There's a lot of people in the pop market. There's a lot of heavily established sharks, so to speak, in the pop market. So. Uh, it, it can get kind of bloody. The water can get kind of bloody. And uh, the other aspect with the the red ocean is that the the big sharks they're always not only are they always uh, you know on offense, but they're also on defense, right? So they're always on alert. Meanwhile, you have a blue ocean, and a blue ocean is obviously you know kind of kind of what it means. It means that there's maybe one or two sharks in there, but there's not a lot of competition. These are more of like your niche markets, and this is where you can uh, you can really grow. You know, in a red market, you know, you you gotta you gotta fight those sharks to be able to grow. But in a blue ocean, you can grow. And really, a blue ocean is what's considered a niche. And Alan, in his career, has worked in three different niches. As I said, I've known him for 22 years, so I've I've known him through all all three of those uh, groups uh, or or those little like genres that he's worked in in the industry. And I think that his story is very interesting because it exemplifies um, how you can consistently find work if you focus on a niche. So welcome, Alan. Thank you, Michael. This is a uh, very nice. Alan's, Alan's coming to us from his home studio. <laughs> and maybe you can talk about that real quick because you obviously have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of uh, stuff hanging on the ceiling and, and on the walls. Yeah, this uh, when we built this house 15, 16, 16 years ago, um, originally intended it to go into the basement, hired a world-renowned acoustician to come in, design the studio, uh, which I, I still have, you know, the basic design of, but um, it was going to be, it was going to nearly double the cost of my house just to do the structural build out on that. And um and we just decided that the way the business was going, I used to track almost everything that I mixed, but I could see a trend in the industry that was going to home studios. And there were a few people that were definitely building home studios, a friend of ours um, that we both know and both assisted for at some point in our career, some did the same thing. And he built a tracking studio in his house and it's working great. Um, I just didn't think it was worth you know, the, the multi six figure number that they had attached to it, um, for what I was doing. And it seemed that the market was changing and most of my clients were going to be mixing clients only. And above that, most of them were out of town. So I really had, uh, and some of them way far out of town. So, uh, I wasn't going to have an opportunity to turn them into tracking clients anyway. So it just didn't make sense. So, we had this uh, unfinished bonus space uh, upstairs and it seemed to be a great dimension and size, a big room. So uh, not a little typical cramped, small extra bedroom kind of space. It's a nice size room, like 19 by 23 or something like that. And uh, we decided to use that. And um, I started mixing in it completely unfinished kind of like you see it now with just insulation everywhere no drywall no nothing and um the very first record i mixed in there won a stellar award so <laughs> yeah. so um you know i was sitting there like a little card table with speakers and a little tiny you know tv screen and um or no i think it was an imac a little imac and uh, that won a stellar so i was like well maybe I don't need the six figure, you know, 
space build out to do quality work. And so it evolved. Um, and there's, there's things that you can't see right now that's behind all that stuff that helped um, make it a better space, but uh, it works. And I learned the room and I tuned the room and um, it just seems to work. So I, I keep getting quality work out of it and there's no reason to change it right now. I, I love, I love that. You're just like, it works now as it is. So I'm just going to leave it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. I mean, I would really like it to be a perfectly finished, you know, LA slick looking, you know, studio or whatever, but um, I'm almost afraid to change it now. I mean, it would cost a lot of money, tens of thousands to do that. And, and then I'd have to go back and put insulation all inside of it again. So, you know, once I put drywall up, it's going to be uh, a giant reflective box. And so then I'd have to put a whole lot more money into a whole lot more insulation and a whole lot of really high end finishes and whatnot, you know, and when I get done, I may not like it, you know, yeah. acoustically, I may not like it. So right now, until I know that I can afford to do it the way I want to do it, or there's a need for it. Like most of my clients, even before COVID, most of my clients didn't, they weren't drop by and hang out kind of clients. So it doesn't have to look good. Um, if, if something changes and it has to look good, then we'll reassess. But right now it works. Yeah. So I'm good. You know, it's interesting how many mix engineers are just mixing out of their, you know, home studios now and small rooms, not even large rooms like what you have, but small mm -hmm. rooms. You know, um, so let's talk briefly about uh, about kind of the 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 niches that you've that you've worked your way into throughout your career. You started sure. uh, here in Nashville. You went to Full Sail also back in the nineties. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I've had a couple of people on who who are Full Sail grads, and uh, and Alan moved to uh, Nashville, and he he started working in the print division of of Benson Records. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's like choral music for church, you know, music for churches, for choirs. Yeah. Which, which you, you might not think would be like a, a, <laughs> a big industry, but it, it actually is a very big industry. And it was a very, very big industry, you know, uh, a long time ago as well. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then, long. Yeah, and then, then, then Alan got hired by a gospel record label. And he was the in-house engineer for all of their records for uh, quite a while. Yeah, about four, four or five-ish years. Yeah, and then uh, and then I then I think the the record label uh, shut down or something or it were merged or something like that. He just had an opportunity to sell it for an exorbitant amount of money, and so he did. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and, he did. And and now Alan, after that, after transitioning out of that. Now he works primarily with jazz artists, and that's been. I uh, think you said you've had like six number ones just with with jazz artists. Yes. Yeah. So, any anything that you want to share about how you navigated from one into the next? <laughs> well, you know, God's providence. I don't know. Um, the uh, starting out as an assistant at the Benson Studio is a large room. I mean, think think. Um, Abbey Road, you know, Ocean Way kind of thing, two stories tall, 50 by 30 feet, you know, kind of thing. We would cut um, large uh, string orchestras as well as, I mean, we were, we were cutting drums, bass, guitar, piano, full orchestra with horns and percussion, everybody in the same room except the drums, everybody in the same room at the same time, all down to analog tape. Uh, when I first got here and then we gravitated to different forms of digital, be it open real digital or, or a dat DA 88, you know, at the time pro tools, wasn't really a functional tracking thing at that time. It wasn't trustworthy yet, but uh, more of an editor and tuning device, but um, start off as an assistant there. And then, uh, you know, through that, developed a few clients and did sessions around town, different places in that same kind of market, the orchestral and choral market. So it's pretty wild. You know, you're cutting all those strings. I mean, it's this is union players, union sessions on the clock. Um, yeah, we had sessions that were going down at $300 a minute. So it was, it was high stress at times, not so much at others, but... Um, 
the uh, the gentleman you talked about that gave me a break and to get me really started as a first and and, and as a, a mixer as well as a tracking engineer um, was a guy at that label. He worked in the gospel division of Benson later uh, when they merged with other labels, uh, it became Verity, uh, which I guess is still going strong today. Um, some of the biggest gospel artists in the industry right now are still probably on Verity. It's a, it's a huge company. Um, lots of big artists. So, um, he used to come down to the studio all the time. The studio's on the first floor, all their offices, the second floor. He would just come by and bop in every couple of weeks, go, Hey, what's going on? Y'all got any new gear? You know, sometimes we'd have stuff from loaners from manufacturers or whatever, and he would come by and check it out. Um, he was just always checking in on us and asking about us and asking about me. And so after Benson got merged and they, that new merged label called Provident decided to build a new building. And so they were left to this one where the studio was. And we were kind of, everybody was kind of out flying on their own at that point. So he called me about mm, six or eight months later and said, Hey, I want to give you a, I uh, need you to come by the house and cut a vocal for somebody. And uh, my other guys double booked or whatever. And um, he loved what I did. And about two weeks later, he said, Hey, I'm starting a new label, building a studio down near where you live. And I want to give you the opportunity to record and mix everything on my label for an indefinite period of time. And so we were doing like nine records in five months um, every year for three or four years. Um, you know, the rest of the year was filled up with other stuff. But I mean, I was able to use his studio and bring in my own clients, most of which were contacts, you know, through him and through the gospel industry. That's when I got started in gospel. So the same sort of thing happened with going from gospel to jazz. It happened about three years ago. Um, ironically, it was one of the first people I worked with at his label doing the gospel thing. He did a series called Quiet Times, and he brought in some of the finest musicians in gospel music, or any music for that matter, but uh, a lot of these are old school gospel guys, and did kind of jazzy versions of hymns and stuff like that for, for kind of gospel prayer time music. Uh, gift market type stuff. So if you'd find it at the Hallmark store. Um, it's very interesting because, because right there, you, you don't really think of that as being like an actual viable income stream, but even stuff like at the Hallmark store, you know, there, there is, there's obviously, you know, a demand for it and there's, there's an industry for it. And that's kind of what's, what's interesting is when you think of, you know, music, I think obviously people immediately gravitate to just the popular music, you know, but, but when they when when it really comes down to building a career as a musician, and of course not only you know as a writer or as an engineer, but even as a player, you know there are a lot of players who make their living playing on a lot of wide variety of of, of music and, and mm -hmm. genres and whatnot. You know that that there are so many different outlets beyond just pop music. There's there's like you know the, the prayer time music. There's children's music. There's all types of other things. Yeah. that allow you to, to generate an income because there's actually a big market for it. Well, you mentioned the children's music and um, I've done some of that as well. There's uh, another guy that was at Benson and he just, him and his wife just had a heart for children's prayer music. You know, there's the little, the little, you know, Jesus loves me type songs that you kids sing in church and stuff like that. They wanted to do good recordings with real musicians and like sing along type stuff. And they would make what we commonly refer to as track music or performance track music, where you could have that and kids could sing along. They'd take the vocals out and you have just the music left and the way kids can sing along with it, either in church or not or whatever. And they made, you know, cassettes and later CDs, you know, for, for, you know, people wear them out in their cars. It's like, you know, all of us, the kids have done with something or other. And um, that's called Cedar My Kids. I've done a few things for them early on when I was at Benson or just coming out of that, that scenario. And um, they are second only, at least they were, imagine they still are, second only in children's music worldwide sales 
to the Disney record company of Disney, Walt Disney Records. Oh, wow. So, yeah, wow. he's made a fortune. And I mean a large multi-seven figure, maybe eight figure fortune doing children's music. Yeah. So. And that's kind of the whole idea with, you know, with, with the concept of, of real musicians don't starve really is that, you know, you, you have to look, you have to, you know, kind of look outside the box. Sometimes you have to expand your horizons and, and find the other opportunities. Cause the reality is that music is all around us, you know, right. but uh, you know, as you were saying earlier, you know, like you, you could see the writing on the wall, right. With the way that the music industry changed things and, and the music industry as, as, as a large conglomerate is kind of what I'm really, you know, referring to, yeah. especially in the early two thousands. And of course we've seen that with, you know, how many studios have shut down over the years. And, you know, we've both experienced that where studios that we used to hang out and spend a lot of time at don't exist anymore, you yeah. know, but the reality is that it, it doesn't mean that music has gone away. It, it just, right. it just means that, that, that we have to find other paths to make a living at it. And, and one of the best things that you can do is step out of that red ocean and find your blue ocean where you can actually grow and, and really, uh, you know, survive. I mean, you knew me back, you know, before I went to Los Angeles when I was struggling, <laughs> <That's annoying. laughs> you know, and, uh, and then, you know, I found obviously the, the, the licensing space and that's, that's where I was able to grow. But I, I especially look back on that now and I think, my gosh, thank Thank God, you know, thank God that presented itself and thank God I was able to to walk down that road because uh, I hate to say it, I, I don't know what I would be doing right now if if I'd have just stayed on that path that I was on, if I had my horse blinders on and wasn't able to look at anything else. I, I right. think I would have ended up like so many other musicians we know who just got completely out of the industry. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We've seen that with a lot of engineers too, you know, who... who oh, uh, definitely. There's a lot of guys that when I moved to town, they were like the guy in their genre. And now they're real estate agents or some yeah. sort of a investment broker or something like that. They just, you know, they, I guess they quickly found out that the days um, in the eighties, especially when country got went crazy and guys were getting $2,500 a day, $3,000 a day to, to engineer and mix, you know, country records back in the late eighties, early nineties. And that was going away fast, you know? Yeah. And, and they, I think they just realized that I can't continue to live the lifestyle that I've become accustomed to in this new, in this new place, this new market, this new world of recording and mixing and, and whatever music you know but that goes that also goes back to the fact that they were they were in that big red ocean that was so highly competitive you know? yeah yeah exa absolutely and, because and, it was so so much was happening and the money was so you know so good that you know of course that attracts a lot of more sharks doesn't it yeah and 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 the, the problem with that though is that when you have more people coming into that red ocean yeah. you have more people willing to do work for less money. And that's so that's it. what drives down the, you know, the, the payments. The, and the reality is that when you work in a niche market and you establish yourself in that, in that niche market, you, you still have the ability to charge a, a fair wage. But if you're, if you're trying to mix, you know, country records where you got the guy down the street who will do it for $200, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, you're, you're, you're fighting a, a strong uphill battle, you know, you're yep. really going against the current. And that's, that's why, like I said earlier, like the sharks who are, the big people who are in that red ocean, they're constantly playing offense and defense. You know, they're, they're, they, they constantly have to be on alert for, the, for yeah. the little guy coming in who wants to steal their, steal their food, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't always change, you know, even, even in a small uh, niche market, you know, we're going to have some of that, but if you can establish yourself, you know, first the, they'll find you, you yeah. know, the people that are willing People that are willing to pay for quality will find you, and mm -hmm. and hopefully you weed the other ones out eventually. Right. So let's talk about about your gear and your process a little bit. Okay. And you you are a Pro Tools user. I am. And uh, and you have uh, you you have uh, uh, you know you're you're mostly in the box, but but you also run outside the box as well. It is definitely a hybrid scenario. I found that when uh, working with. The, the gentleman, when I first came into gospel, he built his studio around um, some modified Apogee converters. So they were like, 
you know, you take a regular Apogee converter, like eight channel converter that was like four grand and then you hot rod it and it's 10 grand by just hot rodding it and making it, you know, the best of every chip and part and capacitor and resistor you could possibly think of. And they were amazing. We had 16 channels of those um, running into, you know, the Pro Tools rig, they were the converter going into Pro Tools. Six channels of API feeding 16 channels of those into Pro Tools, back out of Pro Tools, hardwired into, at that time, what was a SPL um, summing bus, analog summing bus. And I just sounded amazing. And I did a number of tests then because I practically learned Pro Tools on the job. We learned it when I was in full sale, but it was like a four channel you know, device when I was at full sale in the nineties. So it was really basic and we spotted sound effects to video with it. That's about it. You know, um, you lay them back based off time code or something like that, but that's about all you could use it for. Then, um, when I got to Nashville, it was more analog and open real dig. And then Pro Tools finally started working its way in. And, um, you know, there's always been issues with digital. Does it sound warm? Does it sound harsh? Does it, you know, how do we make it warm? Whatever. And some people realized that once we went into the box that when you came out of that big analog console, some of it was warmth, but some of it was depth. I, I feel it's depth that's missing three dimensions um, when you mix in the box. And so when I started using his system with the summing bus, it seemed to be much more three dimensional. And when I did tests with and without, it was day and night. It was really obvious. Um, so when I went on my own, I did the same thing. Um, I'm not using specialized, con like really as special specialized converters, but I am going out of the box to the summing bus and back into the box. Um, as of late, even at a higher sample rate. So that, seems to be helping a lot as well it's even more dimensional it's even more smooth on the top and punchy on the bottom because uh, i'll convert to like 96k as long as my system can handle it as long as the track count's not too high and all that i'll convert to 96k that way what i spit it doesn't make you know the 44 one or 48 session sound better but when i spit it out to the summing bus and it does its thing in the analog world and spits it back in, it spits it back in at 96K. And so whatever magic mojo happens over there in SPL land um, gets resampled at 96K, and, and it does seem to make it an appreciable difference. Um, it also happens again when I leave on the stereo bus uh, out to analog gear on the stereo bus as well. So, and then resampled at 96K again. So I like it. Yeah. And that kind of is, is a great example of everyone has their process, you know, and there are no rules. And, uh, you know, it really does come down to just, you know, setting up the system the way that you like it and the way that that works best for your ears and, and for your perspective of music. And that's one of the, you know, great things about working with so many different people um, at, at a high level who work at a high level is, is you start learning all their little things. Like, you know, obviously, you know, we both know John Yash and he's pretty much entirely in the box, but, you know, the guy's a monster mix engineer and then you're you're in the box out of the box in the box out of the box and same thing whatever you know, it takes. <laughs> pardon yeah. me whatever it takes <laughs> yeah whatever it takes and it just goes to show like there are no rules you know it, but right. but it does boil down to uh very specifically kind of what we were talking about earlier about understanding your room and tuning your room and that's one of the reasons why you know you've left your room the way it is because it it's and it does sound good you have a good sounding room you know, um, yeah. but you have to understand your room and you have to understand how your room plays with audio and how that audio is bouncing around the room, how certain frequencies are canceling themselves out. And, you know, you have to be aware of that. And that's really one of the reasons why when you're mixing music, when you take it to your car and it sounds completely different, it's because your room is playing some massive tricks on your ears and you have to, yeah. you have to get that under control. Yeah. Your room and your, and your monitors and the marriage of the two. Hey, I just want to jump in here for a second and let you know that if any of your goals over the next year include recording and releasing a new album, generating placements of your songs on TV shows and films, or just building a fan base that will sustain your music career, I want to invite you to my special workshop, Real Musicians Don't Starve. Now in this workshop, we're going to focus on the three keys that are essential to your success 
and you're gonna walk away with an extremely powerful strategy that allows you to create your own wow factor. And this gives you the power to attract musical opportunities to you instead of constantly struggling and chasing after them. Now you can check out this workshop for free at realmusiciansdontstarve.com slash workshop. And once again, that's realmusiciansdontstarve.com slash workshop. Now back to the podcast. Let's talk a little bit about what are some of your the favorite plugins that you use. What's a basic uh, setup that you would would be your go to setup when you uh, when you start mixing a, a track? That's an interesting question because um, I don't know that I have I don't know that I have a go to setup. It's specific. Every every mix is specific to that that set of audio. You know, um, mm-hmm. I mean, I definitely have plugins that have fallen in and out of favor over the years there's always you know something new you try and and you definitely i mean i don't know how many thousand plugins i have but it's definitely way up there um there's not too many i don't have um but you definitely weed through them and go okay i like i love this eq you know until this one came out and now this i really like this eq you know whatever um and different one, you know, again, every, every, every set of audio has its own requirements. And so you just kind of, I'm a feel guy. It's, it's got to feel right. Um, and sound right. But I do love, I do love stuff. The, some of the stuff from Lindell audio that, um, you can get through plugin Alliance. They've got a, they've got a Neve, um, a relatively new Neve, console emulator and an api when the api one's really good i didn't think i liked api as well as i did until i heard that plugin it kind of reminded me it's the first one because the the waves api one and you can also get that one i think it's a pretty similar through um ua uad or whatever you are universal audio <laughs> those API plugins never wowed me. I was kind of like, okay, it's, it looks like an API and it functions like an API, but it just, it's just an EQ. And then the one from Lindell audio was like, Oh wow. That sounds like an API. (laughs) Holy cow. (laughs) So that I really like because it has this thickness, this texture to it. that just, I don't know. It's just so reminiscent of the real hardware. Um, It gives you what the other ones didn't. And their 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 Neve is the same way. Also, um, John McBride, uh, Martina McBride's husband, uh, has Blackbird Studio Complex here in Nashville, and they he has a Neve console there that uh, was previously owned by uh, Donald Fagan of Steely Dan fame, and I'm a huge Steely Dan and Donald Fagan fan. Uh, Especially, I mean, the music for sure, but just the way it sounds. So, therefore, all their engineers, too. But um, he used to own that console. They took it, restored it, refined it, made it even better. And by all accounts, it's probably the finest sounding Neve 8078 in existence. And they got with, a, I believe, a Nashville company. Um, I think it's called Kit Audio, K-I-T. You can look it up. Um, and made a plug-in of it. And wow, does it sound good. Holy cow. So okay. that's that's those EQs um, and compressors are on a lot of my channels. Um, I love the EQ from um, Iosis through Slate. It's, um, oh, shucks, his programmer. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of his name. Shucks. Uh, but it's through this. I have this late bundle and it's in that. Um, Fabrice Gabriel. It's his. It was through his company. Bef- I think he had it even before they merged um, with, with Slate. But uh, that EQ is amazing. It's called the Air EQ. And it's got a an RTA running in the background that you can see, you know, what's going on. And then you can see the effect of what you're doing on it as well. So not that I mix visually so to speak, but it helps sometimes when you're like looking for what's this cloudiness in the low end, you can look up and go, Oh, there's that huge bump at 240. Let's just get rid of that, you know, and you can just see it right there on the screen. So that's useful. Um, or you can see what effect 
you're having on the audio, you know, that you're, you know, I'm putting this much in, then I'm putting this much more in somewhere else. And especially up in the highs and you're putting this much more in somewhere else. You look at it and go, wow, that's a lot of moon. I may need to. <laughs> yeah, you, you start getting that, that buildup of, of frequency energy. When, when you're starting a mix, what is your process? Not, not, not plug-in wise, but, but as you're, as you're building out your mix, do you, do you start with drums and then bring in the vocals and the other instruments? Or do you start with, like the other vocals and you put the other instruments around it. Like how, what is your, what is your overall thought process when you're just starting your mix to get a, just to get the basic uh, layout of the, of the levels. Yeah. I get everything um, just laid out the way I want it, you know, get, get the sample rate conversion done, um, get everything ordered the way I want it, renamed the way I want it. If I need to, just because sometimes it comes in, they've, they've done a, a bounce, um, a bounce in place in, in logic or whatever. And the name is like 40 characters long. Cause it's the, it's the synthesizer patch and they just stayed that way. And so I go through and rename it something that makes sense to me. Cause you know, most of those don't. And I'm like, Oh, it's a Rhodes. Okay. Got it. You know, <laughs> name it Rhodes. Uh, but get everything structurally set up the way I want it. And I usually, request a uh, their last rough their latest rough mix so i can kind of get their basic idea of balances um most people can do a decent job of balancing uh how where they want stuff they just the, most most people don't have a good concept of eq they don't have any concept of compression and limiting and um they usually do more harm than good when they use that so uh, it's just, but it's good just to hear like where they want their levels, you know, relative to one another. And I try to get, you know, just a, a feeling like a, like a legitimate, like not how does it sound, but how does it feel to me? And um, then I'll, I'll pull the faders down and just pull them up one by one and just start trying to get a basic rough mix in that kind of gives me the feeling I want relative to what their, their guide is, their rough is. And, um, and then we'll just go from there. It usually does start with drums because I, I really want my foundation strong. I got to get the kick and the bass um, meshed and melded together, melted together so that um, when they're really hitting, you don't, it's not like, Oh, there's kick and there's bass, and you can hear them distinctly. I just want them to be this homogenous thing that happens simultaneously. Even if I need to move one a little bit, so as the mix goes through, I'll, I'll find that you know, oh, that kick and bass is I hit together. You know, if it's intentional, then we leave it. But if it's not, I may have to move it a little bit just to make them sit together or whatever. But mostly, it's just. Uh, faders and eqs i don't start off with much compression on individual channels um i do bus things together so i'll bus all the drums together to a stereo bus sometimes i add the bass to that bus sometimes i keep it out um usually all the keyboard channels to a bus all the guitars to a bus similar you know instrumentation to a stereo bus that way i can always just bring that whole bus up or down or affect it differently if i need to like you know, the whole, the whole guitar bus could get out of control if it's, you know, eight tracks of guitar and they're all have distortion on them and they're all playing all the time. You know, you can get a lot of frequency buildup and my relative levels may be fine and the individual sounds may be fine, but all together, they're just muddying up the whole mix. And I can just go to that stereo channel, slap an EQ on it, find where the find what the problem is, notch it out and we're on our way and everything's still good. Right. So, um, yeah, foundational stuff, uh, drums, drums and bass predominantly get them sitting great. And then whatever seems to be more foundational, be it a piano type or, or roads or other t keyboard type instrument or guitars. So sometimes it's one, it's just, it's usually one or the other is, seems to be more important to the mix. And so then I'll work on those next and then just bring them in and what I think is order of importance. And um, 
I was an instrumentalist and a vocal uh, major in college. So both are important to me. Um, I sometimes will bring the vocals in early and I will definitely bring them in through in and out throughout the mix to see what effect the vocals have on the overall um, mix perspective. But I usually do wait till, till, you know, I've got my instrumental mix kind of how I want it. Then I'll bring them in and then we'll adjust from there if needed. But um, they're going to sit on top anyway. So, you know, I usually wait till, three-fourths of the way through before I get vocals in. So it's interesting. You, you say something very, very interesting. Uh, I want to pick your brain a little bit more about it. But you said that, you know, when you're when you're getting rough mixes from uh, from your various clients, they usually have a good idea of levels, mm. you know, and, and, and giving you the levels that they have an okay idea of the EQs. They have no clue when it comes to compression. <laughs> so no. I, I, I talk about compression a lot whenever I'm doing like live Q&As because it seems like, Anytime I listen to stuff that's sent to me, I, I always have to respond with, you got to lay back on that compression. It's You're just destroying everything. I'd love mm-hmm. for you to talk more about uh, the misuse of compression that you see. Well, I think that... I think that a lot of folks that haven't spent time learning how to be an engineer, um, they're, they're creatives, not that engineers aren't creatives, but I mean the actual creatives, the songwriters um, and producers. They've spent their time honing that craft. They haven't spent 20 plus years like I have honing this craft, you know, and um, they know how they want stuff to sound. They just don't know how to get it there. And they think that if they can't hear something, maybe they need to compress it and turn it up. And um, I would contend that maybe your arrangement is bad <laughs> if you can't hear it. Um, but compression, uh, yeah, a lot of people, I think, when I say most people don't get, don't get it right, I don't even think most people understand what it really is or how it works or what it does. And, I mean, that could be a three-hour conversation we could have some time <laughs> about, you know, <laughs> how it really works, but you know, it, it, uh, it compresses the signal, you know, you've got a, a wave, a sine wave Mm -hmm. and it's going to squash it, uh, down a little bit and remove dynamic range. And unfortunately, if you remove dynamic range from everything, dynamic range, meaning the difference between the loudest point and the softest point of that sound, And it could be any individual sound or any bus group of sounds or the entire mix. Um, It can be used creatively and it can be used for a gain limiting or whatnot, but um, I use it more for tone than anything. Um, I think people just understand that when you, you squish something down like that, remove range, dynamic range, everything starts to get small. I mean, if something is, there's this camera, if something is this big and I squish it down to this big, it sound, it's going to be smaller, right? So if you do that to everything, then all of a sudden everything is smaller. And then you got to turn it up louder. And that's, you know, we, we get into gain, the gain wars, um, loudness wars, when you start doing that on the stereo bus. And we're finding that, you know, that was in the, what, 90s and 2000s and, maybe early 2010s and and then um, streaming started to happen and algorithms in that world started to happen and we started to realize that oh we start level matching stuff from the 70s 80s 90s 2000s and on i mean that stuff from the 70s sounds amazing but it wasn't limited like we're doing stuff now it wasn't compressed like the stuff we're doing now it has life and breath and um texture and tone and all that stuff is not getting squashed out of it. So when people reach to a compressor to solve a problem, I mean, it can be used to solve problems, but, or they just want to make it louder. Let's just squish it and turn it up so we can make it louder. I just think it's a misuse of compression and it can really create some harsh sounds. Um, It depends on whether you're EQing in front of it or behind it. Sometimes, 
that will make a difference in the way the compressor sounds or what the compressor does to the EQ you're using, whether you use it before or after, and people don't think about that. Um, it's it's a big discussion. It could be yeah. a deep discussion. Yeah, so yeah. I just don't. Like, I know compressing drums is a big thing. Um, it's probably a big thing in the pop and rock world. I don't do that much of that. So um, I just don't like it. I want drums to be impactful. I want them to hit hard. I want the a kick drum to hit me in the chest. I used to listen loud enough, unfortunately, <laughs> that I could literally feel the kick drum hit my chest every time it hit. And and I used to be a long hair like you, Mike, even longer. And uh, before, you know, age took over. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, or genetics, I guess. But um, I remember, you know, sitting four feet from, four or five feet away from speakers and having the kick drum go poof and move my hair <laughs> yeah. so i wanted that thing to hit you know i really wanted it to hit and snare too i really wanted snare to feel like it was hitting me right and right between the eyes um and i don't find it does that when i start putting compressors on it it just changes that impact too much for me unless you're going for a specific effect yeah. um, and then i'll use it for that effect but you know you can do a trashy thing um and crush a drum bus you know, or, or, or a bus off of a drum bus and crush it and add it back in a little bit. And it gives you this little underlying texture or tone. I, I'm cool with that. I'm good with that. Um, but I don't want my whole drum kit to sound like that. Yeah. Um, the the yeah. sad thing is when you, is when you listen to a recording and you, and you can, you can actually hear that the snare drum is actually screaming for mercy because the drummer is hitting it so hard. Yeah. But then in the actual track, it just sounds like, puh, puh. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll never forget. You were probably there. We were at the border, and the border John is a Yacht, recording studio in Nashville, by the way. That used that used to exist. Uh, it may still exist as a private complex. I'm not sure. It's but, owned by uh, Yamaha now. When you drive by, it just has a Yamaha sign out there. Oh, does it? Okay, yeah. interesting. I'm trying to find a pencil. Um, I remember being there. I was mixing. John Yash was mixing in the A room on the big SSL, and I think I was in the back room tracking. Um, what was that a Rain Dirk? It was a Rain Dirk console. In the yeah, back, yeah, the guys used to the guys used to be involved with Trident. Made it, it was a beautiful sounding desk. Um, and I, we all came. We all out the coffee machine, and he had just gotten this mix back from mastering, and. He was mad. I was, he I was like, there for that. I actually, I talked to John about that on one of our calls and, and you know, that, that I did with him and uh, he yeah, hot. he, he, uh, he, he launched that CD across the room. It, it, it was such a, I was there for the mixing yeah. and I was so excited for that record to come out. Cause I could not wait to buy that record and listen to it in the car. I was so excited. And I remember listening back to the, to the mastering and uh, with, with him and just crushed it. Just absolutely yeah, destroyed bad. it. He did throw the CD across the room and he were, I remember him standing out in the hallway and he said, he said that snare was so huge. And now it sounds like a pencil hitting a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. And, I listened and that's, to it and that, that's actually specifically that what the, I remember being in that session yeah. with him when we were mixing that. Like. I remember my, when the chorus came in, the hair on my arms would raise. Yeah. I mean, he, he crafted that mix so beautifully the guitars came in. I mean, everything came in. I remember, I remember thinking, I cannot wait to buy this. I cannot wait to just drive and listen to this. And, and he did three songs on that record and they all sounded amazing. But there was one song in particular that just was crushing it. And when it came back from mastering, they just destroyed it with compression. And it was, it, it was really sad. Actually, I, I pulled that, that CD out probably about two months ago just to give it a listen again. And, mm -hmm. and I still remember how that feeling I had in the studio listening to that mix. And, and when the chorus comes in, you're just like, oh, I guess the, oh, I guess we're in the chorus now. Yeah. Like it's sad when you're cruising along in this and the, you get to the chorus and the mix level drops. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh man, really? That so, was, that yeah. was one of my biggest early lessons about the complete misuse of compression. And of course, that's it. you know, I always talk very highly of John because I studied under John and, and, uh, and uh, he's just an amazing mix engineer. And right. You are as well. And I think we all come from, you know, we were all part of that same little crew. And, you know, when I first we came were, to class, I met you. I and, came up under one of his old assistants. So, yeah. 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 And, and all and, the family. 
Yep. And and there's there's that thing I think inherently that we have that drums and 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 power and and dynamics, it doesn't matter what genre of music you're you're you know mixing, just that needs to be there. And um that I still remember that. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget I I never forget how excited I was to get that record, and I, I'll never forget how how crushed I was to hear that that how, so how, apparently how, they never remastered it. No, no that's that, highly that, unfortunate. Because yeah, I've unfortunate. I work with a guy now, a mastering engineer out of Chicago, and um I just love his work and he really gets it. And he's um he's mostly out of the box. He's rarely in the box. He's he's a he's a Mazalek guy and um uses other things too, but mostly Mazalek stuff. But he's so dedicated to the craft and so dedicated to audio and the way it's supposed to sound and which I guess is subjective, but I mean, you know, just how it's supposed to sound, how it's supposed to feel. And I remember the first time we worked together, we, we were working on a guy that was uh, working on a guy's project who was a mutual friend. Um, in fact, that's how I met this, this mastering engineer. And we, I sent him the first mix and we had a long discussion about compression because I had done a fair amount of compression. Now, the way I do compression is more like peeling the layers of an onion. So you will rarely ever see me do more than a dB and a half, two, B of, two dB of compression on anything at one time. Now I may do it four times on the same channel, but I'm not doing more than one, one and a half to two dB with any one of those four things. Um, but I had done a fair amount of compression on this thing and on the, on the stereo bus. And it was just really feeling great. Huge mix, 160 something tracks, probably gospel. And uh, I mean, everything in two kitchen sinks and all that, you know? So um, it's really hard to get that much stuff to, be heard and poke through or whatever. That's why I try to stay off as much compression as I can. But anyway, the story is I really wanted to talk to him about that because I really didn't feel like it needed any much more compression at all. That maybe just some peak limiting, you know, as well as whatever EQ he, he felt necessary. And he ensured me that he was a do no harm kind of mastering engineer. And when I got the mix back, um, well, the client, called me and was like have you heard it yet and i said no so he sent it to me and i listened to it and i called him back i was like well what do you think not wanting to give my hand away you know and he was like um it sounds a little compressed to me and i was like no it sounds a lot compressed to me it was the same kind of thing it was just hammered yeah. it was absolutely destroyed and i called the mastering engineer back and he's like oh i'm only doing like four or five dB of compression with one compressor and maybe like 10 or 12 with another. And I'm thinking on the stereo bus, I mean, you know, on the, on the whole mix, you gotta be kidding me. So ironically, um, he is my favorite mastering engineer right now because we've, we've worked through stuff over the years and we work together through mixes. I send as much as I can to him and I'll send him stuff literally halfway through the mix. I mean, sometimes even before I put vocals in, I'm sending him, a ref going hey how do you feel about this how do you feel about this low end you know i've got one range of frequencies in the lows in my room that's problematic and i know basically where it is but it's still deceiving sometimes in the mix and so i'll call them up and say hey dropped one in our drop box what do you think you know tell me what you think how's my low end where's my spot you know whatever how's my spot and he'll send it back and go, hey, it sounds great. You know, I could use a little more of this or a little less of that, but everything sounds great. But we do it proactively throughout the mix, which I don't know too many people that are doing that. I love that relationship with him. And um, and we've definitely worked out the the uh, compression and limiting <laughs> scenario too. So You, 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 t you touch on a, a very cool element though here, and, and that's like the teamwork aspect. Yeah, you know, um, I think a lot of musicians approach music as a solitary endeavor. You know, well, I'm going to do it, and then when I'm done, I'm going to hand it off, and then they're going to do the thing or whatever. 
Yeah. And, and that's really not the way it should be even, you know, even outside of mixing, even in say like the, the space that I live in, of course, the licensing world, you know, I'm always so adamant about like, you have to have relationships with the people that you're working with and you should be in contact with them, you know? And, right. uh, and this is a great example of, 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 uh, of, of that as well in the mixing process, you know, you, you have your contact who's a mastering in, in, engineer, who's your team member. He's just as important through the process, right? Cause he's going to get it next, you know? Absolutely. So you want to make sure that as you're mixing it, you're giving him, you know, stuff that he can use. And if he's recognizing any problem frequencies or something along, along the way, he's giving you a heads up because as, as you work on your own thing, you can get so married to it, you know, that you lose perspective and, and, you're and deceived. Yeah. And I know that there's the whole thing of like, you know, some musicians are like, well, I don't want anyone listening to it until it's done and stuff like that. I don't think that's the best idea when it comes to creating a product that's going to generate income for you. Yeah. You know, and that's really what we have to do is we have to look at our songs as assets and these are income producing assets that we're creating. You know, now if you follow the traditional industry, industry rules, you know, it's worth nothing, but if you actually approach it, you know, as, as an asset, then, you know, it is some, it is worth money. And, and that's ultimately the goal, right? We want to create music. So that we can continue right. creating music. We want to be able to sell that music so that we can continue creating music and not, you know, go work at Home Depot throughout the day. Right. Right. So there is that mindset shift that we have to look at this as what can I do to make this as viable as a product as I can. And the reality is that having team members and, and playing this as a team sport uh, is, is so important. So your story is is awesome. Uh, it's, it's a great example of, you know, someone at a pro level you know, approaching it as a team sport. And, you know, of course, yeah. you, know, you get the benefits of having the team member, you know, give you, give you constructive criticism on, on what they can use more of or, or, or whatnot through the, through the mixing process. And of course that just takes a lot of the guesswork away as you go through the process as well. Yeah. And you start, you start finding, I mean, I, there was a, some mastering engineers here in Nashville that I really like as well. They, they've done every Garth Brooks record ever released. Um, and they're really good with, you know, acoustic, uh, like Americana style music and stuff like that as well. Um, and I, I've worked with them on gospel stuff over the years for, for a while until I found, uh, until I found Roger. But, um, I remember some of the very first things they, they did for me. This is back when I was working with that, with uh, Paul, that original guy that gave me my break. Um, something went to something with one of the other, I was with, Paul, but I was working with another client and they took it down there to those mastering guys and um, they're called independent mastering. They're downtown uh, Nashville. And they're great. They're phenomenal. They have more, they have more golden platinum records than they have wall space to put them on. It's, they're amazing. Um, they, uh, I noticed that every time I went to them, they're notching the same frequencies out. Just, I mean, cause I, I definitely strive to, and I think I do deliver a consistent, sound it's not my sound but it is how i hear you know i mean i don't i don't strive to deliver a sound meaning my sound i don't want my fingerprints all over it but i can't help but have my hearing all over it because that's all i have is my hearing how i hear it so it's gonna the frequency response of it is probably going to be fairly consistent because it's how i hear in my space on my speakers so for what 12 years or something like that now in this room, probably. So <clears throat> I don't even know now how long it's been probably. Yeah. 12 or more, 13 years. So, um, but yeah, I started noticing they're doing the same things, uh, with the same pieces of gear. Like they would choose, okay, on this EQ, they're, they're cutting this little frequency fairly narrow. And on this EQ over here, they're real broad and they're lifting the top a little bit and blah, 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 you know, whatnot. So I started, noting that and doing that on my own beforehand. And then I would take it back to them the next time and they would do have to do less. And so I started talking to them about it and they're like, yeah, if, if I knew ahead of time. So I started doing that with them as well. But that, that was about the time I started working with Roger. And then I was like, Oh, I'm just going to, I was going to start working with him that way right off the bat. We're just going to have this, we're just going to have this conversation, you know, throughout the process. It just makes sense to me. Um, cause he would occasionally come back and say, Hey, if you could, this mix is great. I love it. If you could give me 
one DB more bass guitar, it would help me. Um, because if I try to bring up the bass guitar, I'm gonna have to bring up this whole frequency range that it's playing in, and that's gonna muddy up other stuff. So if you just turn it up a DB or two, then I don't have to do it. And it completely frees me up to not muddy that part of the mix up. I was like, oh, okay, no problem. You know, make a quick edit, drop another drop box. Yep, perfect. We're done. Okay, great. So yeah, it just made sense to work that way. I mean, think about it. You, in the old days, we got together with musicians in a studio in the same room at the same time, and they played and we worked on the arrangement. The producer worked and the arranger worked, and blah, blah, blah. And everybody worked it out. And musicians would have suggestions. Oh, what if we both, what if the organ and the guitar player both play the same lick at the same time right here? That'd be kind of cool. It'd be a feature thing, blah, 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 blah. And they work out this great arrangement together as a team, um, you know, ideas that come together as a team why wouldn't we do that as engineers as well? Why not? Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. I, I love that. And that's, that's great advice for anyone who is, you know, at home making their own records and, and whatnot that, uh, you know, you, you, you find, you know, find a mastering person that you can work with and, and yeah. start having that conversation, send them some of your tracks, get some feedback before you send them your final mix, you know, and this is the difference really between playing, on an amateur hobbyist level and playing at a professional level, you know, I mean, you've mixed a lot of tracks for me. I've sent you a lot of tracks over the years to get your ears on. And, and that's, you know, and the same thing with, with my partner, when I'm doing stuff with, with David and stuff like that, you know, like we were constantly sending files back and forth to get another perspective of it, you know, and it's right. not, it's not, you know, someone shooting down your mix or, or shooting down your ideas. It's, it's getting a fresh perspective of, what's working and what's not and what could benefit the song, you know, and that, this is one of the things where we really have to take our ego out of it, you know, because the goal is what's going to benefit the song because whatever benefits the song is what's going to allow that song to actually go out and, and work for you. Right. And when yeah. that song works for you at a good level, at a high level, it generates income for you, which allows you to stay in your studio creating music as opposed to, like I said earlier, you know, getting a job at home Depot throughout the yep. day. You know? Not a terribly creative environment. Probably not. No. Yeah. No. Maybe maybe if you're mixing paint, it is. But unless you work in wood, yeah, not. or paint, yeah. But yeah. well, I always I always love to to end uh, our, our our interviews with with the real musicians don't starve manifesto, and that is that real musicians are business owners, and our business is music. A business is simply an organization where value is provided in order to make a profit. And unlike starving musicians who operate with a mindset of scarcity and fear. As success-driven musicians, we operate with a mindset of abundance, confidence, and service. We are doers, we are dreamers, we are creators, and we are achievers. And we know that our true value is determined by how many people we serve and how well we serve them, because our truth is that real musicians don't starve. So with that said, Alan, uh, I want to thank you for uh, sharing some of your mixing uh philosophies and and uh and thoughts with us and uh you know mixing uh that that's that that's kind of a it's a big hurdle for a lot of musicians you know and it's uh, it's something that you know just because you buy logic or or pro tools or whatever you know daw you're using it does not mean that you are suddenly an engineer you know yeah so so i encourage you to to try and learn from other mix engineers and and learn what they're using, learn what they're doing, learn how they're approaching their songs, because you can have a great song, <laughs> but a great song with a bad mix is something that no one really wants to listen to. Truth. It's my, it's my opinion on that. Yeah. So, Alan, once again, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us. And uh, we will chat with everyone else a little later. Thank you, Michael. 